On this week's video version of our podcast, Trailcam Radio, we're sitting down with John Mulligan. John currently resides in Iowa and is an industry professional. He owns and operates Bourbon Barrel Game Calls, a show called Arrow Wild, and is a professional photographer. We talk about John's upcoming turkey season, a little bit of deer talk, some old cop stories, and getting in the outdoor industry. John was on this last week's episode of Whitetail Cribs, so be sure to check that out. If you enjoyed the podcast, be sure to that like button and subscribe. Lights, camera, follow the trail. I'm ready to shoot. If you know where a deer's bedding and you know where he's eating, that deer should be dead. Camera. If you're passive on a deer, what you're doing is you're teaching. I've got 30 bucks in the Michigan record book. Everyone but one has had at least one previous wound on his body. Some had as many as four. <laughs> trail Cam Radio from the guys at Exodus. <laughs> All right, we are live here in the Quality Inn. What town is this? Fort Madison. Fort Madison, Iowa. We are in a conference room. We're actually set up on a table for a job fair, speed interview type of yeah. kind of deal. But mm-hmm. we're using it now to sit down with our good friend, John Mulgan, Johnny Utah. Um, I just wrote down real quick of all the things that I could introduce you with. So I'll just do these <laughs> real quick here. So we have John Mulgan, uh, Arrow Wild TV. Yep. Bourbon Barrel Calls. Yep. Uh, Johnny Utah Creative. Yep. And I feel like I'm probably forgetting something. No, no. That's okay, pretty, all right. That's pretty much got it all. all yeah, right. that's, that's pretty good. Man yeah. of many uh, names and ventures. Yep. So uh, if I didn't cover anything, do you want to introduce yourself to any degree? And I'll say this too. Uh, not this past year, I guess, Harrisburg 2018, we sat down for... Yeah, it was like a round table. Um, no, no, no. We, we did one with just the three of us. We did? Yes. Episode really? No. I bet you a hundred dollar bill right now. Ooh. <laughs> Confidence. Bucks. I'm not taking that, that bet or no? No, I'm not taking that bet. I thought the first time we sat down was Harrisburg. With Clint and Cody, yeah, like yeah, the yeah. little round we, table type thing. In uh, it was in our booth, but uh-huh. we recorded um Uh-oh, a day like, before that. I'm gonna just just because you know yeah, I don't th- I'll tell you what episode number it is so everyone go back and listen to I'll it. I'll bet you okay, <laughs> you know the warm bush light we got in the car? Uh-oh. Okay. The loser shotguns up here. Oh. All right, episode thirty one. So God there you go. Oh. Uh, Are you John- serious? John Mulgan, early season trail camera tactics. I got three <sighs> downloads already this month. <laughs> it's Dude. a seasoned uh we released it March third or March eighth, two thousand nineteen. So literally Three hundred and sixty some days ago, yeah. almost exactly a year yeah. ago. Yeah. That's weird. Wow. So, Ooh, I like how's it. that for annual data? <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> Pretty cool. So yeah, uh, I guess with all that, John, you want to tell us a little bit about <laughs> much stuff? Well, the idea is um, get into a lot of things and see which one sticks. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, no, I mean what I like trying to do is uh, the idea. I always say it's like a like an engine, like a one cylinder engine or like a V eight. If you can have Bourbon Barrel Calls, Arrow Wild TV, Johnny Utah, Johnny Utah Creative, and then you throw in a Carbon TV and a YouTube, and, and it, hopefully you can get all of those firing and they're all complementing on each other. That's that's the premise behind it. But I do like to be involved in a lot of stuff. You know? busy, gonna, busy guy. Yeah. Yeah, and all those things do kind of complement each other when you can do product photography and yeah, you yeah. can do all those things in-house. Right, right. Big so. Plus. Big yeah, place. yeah, definitely. And you just started Bourbon Barrel Calls relatively... November 3rd was the day the site went live. Um, nothing like starting a turkey call company say. in the middle of the whitetail rut. Yeah. <laughs> uh, timely <laughs> timely yeah. launch. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I guess, w- tell us a little bit about, uh, with the name like Bourbon Barrel Calls, some people's uh, imagination may wonder sure. and think, but... Um, well, you know... Sometimes you see names that don't exactly say what the product is. And I wanted to kind of go back the other way when it was like Jim Miller's painting company. You know it's Jim Miller and he paints stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So bourbon barrel calls is essentially what it is, um, making game calls out of bourbon barrel lids. And the idea, it started during turkey season. And a buddy of mine, we were talking about, different categories in the industry that are just completely saturated like what is what could be more saturated other than like turkey calls or cooler companies you know and um so i thought about it thought about it and i thought yeah there's got to be a spin on (laughs) on doing the turkey calls um being from kentucky and having a um a love of bourbon i thought (laughs) man what if what if the wood was thick enough but i didn't know i had never really 
like looked closely at the thickness of a bourbon barrel lid to see if the height, you know, would allow you to do it. So I started prototyping some stuff out. Once I kind of came up with a, with a design and a sound that I liked, um, then got into the, doing the bourbon barrel lids. And then that was a little bit of education because, um, wood that's wet, that's green, that dries, does it a, a certain thing. Uh, wood that's been soaking in an alcohol based, you know, liquid for five, seven, 12 years, when it dries, it does something totally different. So there's a lot of cracking and checking and warping. And there's a lot of stuff that kind of came into play. But um, it's, it's been cool to like add the little marketing touches to it and collaborate with different companies. And, and I don't even know what bourbon barrel calls is going to ultimately be someday. Um, I have a, have a game plan, but it's also very fluid. And as you guys know, when you guys are hands on with your own company and a direct consumer, the same as bourbon barrel calls, you're not relying on a dealer to dictate your sales growth. You get to dictate your sales growth. And, yep. and that's the other major you know component of the business is i wanted to put everything back on me to where i could control my destiny much as the way you guys have done with exodus yeah i mean i guess it's a little bit different than um um your your previous uh, correct business ventures i guess you yep. know co-owner of uh, a wicked tree gear before the yep. tecamati um acquisition yep. so the you know you're absolutely familiar with the uh, familiar with the industry on the on the retail side so this is probably <coughs> yeah. the first consumer direct it is yeah. yeah yeah i'd watched other companies do it um obviously um you know you and i have been talking about business stuff for the last three years you know pretty consistently so you know i got to pick your brain and i got to see some other companies like maven optics and some other companies that are doing direct consumer models and to me if you can do the marketing and the photography and you have a creativity like um if you have that in you then why you need to do it yourself because no one can sell your product like you can. Absolutely. Are you so? Walk us through, I guess, kind of the supply chain of that. Are you making these? Are you? Um, where are you getting the barrels? Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. But maybe without giving out too much. Oh yeah, no, no. Knock you off. Um, so once I came up with this prototype, then I had to find a CAD guy. Because even back in the wicked days, you know, Todd was the CAD guy. I, I don't. That's not what I do. So. Um, once I came up with a design, I found a buddy of mine back home that was able to help me with the, the CAD drawings. And um, these can be turned by hand, but it's very tedious. We're talking like two, three a day, right? Maybe four a day. Um, and my very first order was for 50 calls you know, on day one. I'm thinking, oh, man, that's a 25-day lead time you know, just <laughs> for the pots. I'm like, well, this isn't going to work. So I am outsourcing my design to a CNC wood shop. And they're able to turn 100 a day for me if I need to. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I secure uh, the barrel lids. And thank you to Pinterest, there's a ton of bourbon barrel and barrel lid supplier wholesalers all over the place. And I found a guy uh, back home in Kentucky, was able to secure those. And then what I do is I cut the what I call the blanks. So it's essentially like a large hockey puck. Um, then those go through a kiln drying process. And then they get sent to the CNC guy. He cuts my design and sends me the cut pot back. Then it goes into um, an oil preservation stabilizer, wood stabilizer process, a little bit of Danish oil, um, and, a, and a matte finish is applied to that. I have a supplier that supplies me with my crystal. Um, now the soundboards, I outsource the soundboards to a laser engraver out of Illinois. Um, but the charred wood sound boards, I'm doing those myself on a, on a bandsaw, and I'm actually just shaving just a tiny little sixteenth of an inch. You know, I'm just shaving that charred wood piece off, and then I cut those into three-inch circles, and they get set in there. And everybody says, well, man, do a slate call. Well, the idea of bourbon barrel calls is it's a crystal striking surface for two reasons. One, I like the sound of crystal. It's got that raspy, loud sound. But two, it's a shadow box picture frame. You know, the, the, it's not just what's on the backside of the pot where you see, you know, beam or makers or whatever. Um, it's being able to look inside of it. And it's like you're looking inside of like an empty bourbon barrel. You know, you see the charred wood. Um, the oak strikers, um, once those come to me turned, then I apply the hot wax uh, striker with the logo uh, ceiling on there. I now have upgraded to a hot gun and I put the, I put the wax in there and I'm doing them. But the first 50 I was doing literally with the stick and a lighter drip, 
Drew, like a candlestick? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ooh. that's how I did the first 50, and it just it was taking forever. So now I, I load them into the gun and just, you know, and then I can stamp them. But everything's packaged up in a wood box. Um, because of the turnaround time with the lids, uh, that bourbon smell is still there. Um, so everything's packed into wood shavings, um, and it comes delivered branded. The outside of the box is branded, and it's just a lot of plays off of, like, you know, the bourbon industry and, and the way a bourbon barrel is already um, is the idea behind it. But we do a moonshiner's call like you're pulling up yep. there. Um, I use a copper soundboard that's got a little patina added to yeah. it, so it looks like that old copper still. It's been out in the woods. Uh, the branded call has the charred wood. And then we do the engraving. It's amazing the way that's been taken off. Uh, other companies, friends of ours that we're all mutual friends with in the industry are wanting to get calls done. Groomsman's uh, presence. And it's just, it's been kind of neat to see the different engraving ideas that people come up with. And they want to get personalized or maybe you know, memorial type stuff. And different outfitters are getting into it. And yeah, so it's uh, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm looking at some of these. Yeah, I'm looking at some of it now. It's really, mm -hmm. really neat. Um, are people too scared? Like this is a nice. This feels like a collector's piece. Are people yeah. uh, are putting it up on the, next to their nice bourbon, or are they taking it hunting with them? I would say, I would say sixty percent of them will probably never see the woods, mm -hmm. and it's a lot of people. And, and people say, "Hey, I, this is never going to go outside. Um, it's too cool of a call to take out there." And then when people actually hear it for the first time, they're like, oh, it actually sounds good. <laughs> like, I just thought this was kind of a novelty piece, you know? And I'm like, no, it was, it was meant to be, it was made to, sound, you know, made to sound good. I mean, you ought to see all the prototypes I've got at the house, you know, different woods and different shapes and designs and stuff. But, um, you know, and I know that I'd kind of talked to Chad about it throughout the, like, the creative process, you know. And I would just kind of throw something out there and just would gauge – I was basically, I would treat guys like Chad and a couple other my buddies as consumers. And if Chad was like, huh, that's pretty cool. I'm like, yeah, we'll put check mark next to that. <laughs> if he didn't say anything, I'm like, yeah, I'll do a line through off. that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just kind of going through the process of it. And it's uh, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's cool to kind of see it. <laughs> like, like you mentioned, the November launch. And even, I mean, that's not really that long ago. And I feel like... No. Uh, You've made a lot of ground in that short amount of time. Yeah, moved uh, moved about 200 calls so far um, since November 3rd. So, um, you know, in all honesty, the first couple of days I only sold, you know, five or mm -hmm. something. You know, it wasn't until uh, right a week before Christmas and then just, you know, in the last, you know, 30 days have things really started to take off. Nice. Yeah, we're just now approaching like, I mean, Florida just opened up uh, March yeah. 7th and part of the, part of the state. Texas is coming around. So mm -hmm. we're just now getting into, uh, like, I guess this is peak uh, anticipation sure. really, right now mm -hmm. for, for, mm -hmm. for Spring Gobbler. So, and, um, I, you know, and I knew this was going to be kind of a seasonal business. And for me, I wanted it to be seasonal. I, I don't need another 365 job. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted it to kind of fill in the gap you know, towards the end of deer season and then that kind of season kickoff before things get out of hand after trade show season and, and that kind of stuff. So the timing of the, of the business, you know, fits my life as well for what I've got going on right yeah. now. I know for us, like this is, you know, as a content creator like you, um, this is a time that we struggle with in-house content because we're mm -hmm. not really, I mean, truthfully speaking, we're not really turkey nuts, you know what I mean? Yeah, so it's yeah. like... <clears throat> March, April, some we're just long, trying to some <laughs> long months. We're just like, yeah, we're just trying to yeah. buy time. Like, yeah. all right, what can we talk about on the podcast? What can we do with what? What can we do with YouTube? What? I mean, it's always a struggle, a little bit for us. Um, but yeah, I, I can see how that fits like this your cyclical uh, workflow. You know, yeah, throughout the season. So, what do you? I guess leading into turkey season, what do you have going on? For I know you travel a lot and hunt. So what's uh, yeah? What do you got in store? Um, you know, I I still like doing trade shows. Um, not so much like I now I'm doing more trade shows with other companies and, and helping them out. Um, and I only do it with the companies that I'm working with through Air Wild TV. Um, some people will go and help, you know, people do shows because they're getting paid a day rate, you know, to help out a trade show or something. Um, for me, it's literally a, it's a chance to talk to consumers and just kind of stay plugged in to what people are buying. And then I'm not biased because it's not my company. Right. Um, so that's the main reason I like doing them. Um, 
Or I shouldn't say it. It's an added bonus, you know, for helping out those companies and stuff. But hitting a few shows, um, trying to get a little shed hunting in from time to time. But, uh, you know, uh, March 21st, I'll be starting down in Florida chasing, uh, I call the the goblin flamingos down there. So. <laughs> Um, I, this, this year I'm, I'm going to really, really, really try to pull off a single season slam with my bow. Um, and somebody said, well, what about, are you going to go down South, like way down South and go for the ghouls, you know, to get that, like, what is it called? The, like the super, super slam or a grand slam or whatever for turkeys. But I'm like, no, I don't like, I don't even like Dos Equis and, you know, <laughs> Corona that much anyways, but I'll just stick to the, the Northern slam or whatever that is. But um it's something i've always wanted to do and and i like chasing turkeys before things really get get cracking it's fun you kind of have a dos Equis, the what's the guy you have a patine of similar to him if you, <laughs> you put some make some gray in here uh maybe put a little more tan on there you yeah probably yeah. be similar to that guy yeah you don't see it <laughs> no. you know what no. i'm talking about no i didn't catch it no it went over my head like <laughs> i could tell from the family <laughs> he's like what i, <laughs> I get no. that pretty often um do you know the commercial I'm talking about? No. The most interesting guy in the world. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's a, yeah, 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 yeah. I know who you're talking about. There's he's sitting at the table like suit, white shirt. Like, yeah. Three hot chicks. Oh, yeah, uh, hey, that could be a compliment if I look that good and distinguished as that guy someday. That'll be good. Yeah, I mean, I just got it. Be the most interesting man. Anyway, so uh, what are those states then to do that or accomplish that? Um, start off, obviously, Florida yep. being the first season that comes in. It's the only place you can go get those uh, those Osceolas. So start there. Um, then I'll head to Nebraska, and I'll go northwest and southwest Nebraska, um, northwest for the Miriam and southwest for Rios. Uh, I'll be hunting just public land there. And then uh, I'll come back here between Iowa and Kentucky and chase, uh, chase you know, Easterns. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the big thing is obviously start off with the Osceola. Like if I don't get that, then it's, <laughs> it's shot right off the, right out of the gate. But um, if I get that one, I'll feel pretty comfortable. Uh, I've never had a season where I didn't kill an Eastern uh, from the very first year I ever started hunting turkeys. Um, I guess there's always a first, but, um, I told my wife, I said, when I go to Nebraska, if I kill the Osceola and I go to Nebraska, I am not coming home until I kill one of each It may be two days. It might be two weeks, but mm-hmm. you know, if I, if I pull off the Florida bird, um, then it's game on that. Are I'm you committed. a, uh, are you like a turkey hunting purist where like you won't kill them off the roost or no, so yeah. you, whatever it takes. No, 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 no. Yeah. You I, are a yeah. Purist. Um, I mean, as soon as they pitch down, but yeah, I would never shoot one in a tree. Yeah, that's what yeah. I mean. Like yeah. on, on the pitch down, like going setting up underneath roost. Oh, yeah. Pitch down. <laughs> oh, I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll, if I have to catch them. Um, and, and if I, and if I put some birds to bed, um, you can guarantee I'm setting up 70, 80 yards from that tree. Um, although I, that is always a tactic, it never seems to work for me because whatever side they're going to pitch down, it's going to be opposite of me. Um, <laughs> But I'm a, I'll be honest, I'm more of a late afternoon guy. They don't gobble as much, and I just try to cut them off going back to bed. Mm-hmm. And if you've, got a, if you've got a good decoy spread and you're being, not being up too obnoxious and just doing some soft purrs and some feeding stuff and a little bit of clucking, it's almost like those big toms are like, all right, I'll get into one last little squabble yeah. before I call it a day. And they'll come over real silent. And they'll come in and want to pick a fight with my Jake decoy and – I usually get an arrow at them. You're, yeah, I was gonna say you're doing this with a bow too. Mm-hmm. Only, yeah. My very my very first turkey I ever killed, I killed with a shotgun, um, and that's it. And that's actually the last animal that I've ever killed with a gun, ever. Hmm. What does that decoy spread look like? For me, I always run um, nine times out of ten. I'm gonna run a Jake and two hens. Um, the only variance will be uh, a Jake and three hens, and it's just more of how aggressive do I want to get or whatever, but I always run the Jake. Um, I'll always run the Jake facing me. Um, cause I can get those birds to kind of circle around the backside of him. Um, it seems to work pretty good for me that way, but, um, then I'll run the hens facing away. I don't want, I don't want any Tom to think that a hen's possibly looking at the blind or looking my direction where there might be noise or movement or something like that. But, um, 
Uh, I like doing um, a breeding hen um, underneath the jake, and then I like doing a feeding hen. And then, like I said, the variants would be the upright hen. I run that every once in a while. But, I mean, I'll literally run these things, man, 20 feet, 25 feet from the blind. I mean, I run them right there. Hmm. So, um, you know, and that's the that's the other thing, like deer to turkeys, you know, it's so different. I mean, um, I've got video footage. I was in Kentucky, and my camera guy, we pulled up uh, in my truck and put the tailgate down. We're thinking we're going to walk about 100 yards to set up the blind and the decoys. And he's getting his tripod and camera, and he pitched the blind out. And I hadn't thrown it over my shoulder yet. And I'm like, oh, I got a pot call in my, in my pouch right here. I'm like, ah, eh, let's just see what's going on. I strike. Bam, bam, bam. I got three different times, you know, that answer and that are hammering. And he's like, damn you, you know, give me a second. So I'm like, just throw the blind up right here. Like right next to the truck. We were five feet from the tailgate of the truck. <laughs> and the video, he's, he punches record, and the video footage is like this because he's still leveling up the tripod. <laughs> and I'm like, just punch record, you know, anyways. And he's leveling up the tripod. He's like, give me a second. I'm not even level yet. And I'm like, I'm already at full draw. I'm like, dude, you better <laughs> lock on one, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was, uh, that was pretty funny. And that's and that's turkey hunting, yeah. you know. It's, it either happens right away or it doesn't happen, you know. Yeah, that, turkey hunting is a lot of fun, especially when they're fired up. <clears throat> oh and you, yeah. In those early spring mornings when you have yeah a bunch just answering. It's, yeah, yeah. It's pretty easy to get excited. Oh yeah, yeah. It's I mean, um, and I don't say this in a derogatory way, but it's you know, it's like poor man's elk hunting. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like hearing a bugle <laughs> is no different than hearing a tom. Like man, when they they hammer and they're 20 feet from you, it's like they're hammering through your chest, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then the spitting and the drumming, like the, I remember the first time I heard that, you know, you hear this, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I'm doing this every year, you know, for as long as I live. Mm -hmm. You just probably made some Western person mad. Probably. <laughs> they hate when you compare turkey hunting. I, I know. I, don't, I know. <laughs> and they're like, their feelings get hurt real easy. Oh, I know. I know. But, well, you know, and this year I'll be going on my first elk hunt ever um, in Idaho, and I'm sure I'll have the same feeling then. I'll be like, oh, my gosh, you know, that elk just bugled through my soul, you know. And I'm I, looking forward to it. I went elk hunting. I didn't have that experience, but. So, so I've still heard. Yearn. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I still yearn it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me know how that goes. I'm sure, I'm sure, it'll, I'm sure it'll be great for I you. I hope. I hope. Um, so Idaho. Okay. So Florida, Nebraska, Nebraska, Iowa. Iowa, Kentucky. And then um, what's going on in the summer? Noodling in uh, in Alabama with uh, Hannah Barron. Are you doing that? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna go down to Alabama. She invited me to come down there and go uh, go noodling. I hope I don't lose a finger. Um, <laughs> get bit. <laughs> yeah, gonna get yeah get bit. So uh, I met Hannah last year down in Kentucky. She was hunting with Whitetail Heaven Outfitters, and I was down there doing photos for them. And I mean, obviously, we knew of each other, but like we never really talked much. And we hung out four or five days there, and um. <sighs> I watched her go to her set by herself. She shot the nicest buck that week. Um, and four o'clock in the morning, I was taking some photos of some other hunters who had tagged out that night as well. And, and I looked around and I said, Hey, so where'd Hannah take off to? And they're like, I don't know. She might be down there in the barn. So I drove down to the barn and she's down there by herself. She's gutting her deer, skinning it out and quartering it up. And I'm like caping it. And, I'm, and it wasn't like she was doing it for the first time. I mean, she was making short work of it. And I walked up to her and I said, hey, I've been known to give a few Instagram hunches a hard time. I was <laughs> like, you earned my respect, you know, and um, she shook my hand with a bloody hand, you know, and I <laughs> thought, man, that's cool. So we, her and I, we've always been, you know, we, we've been, you know, pretty good friends since then. And, you know, we chit chat pretty regular and we got to joking about, um, about noodling. And so she said, well, you need to come down and do it. And I said, come on, don't tease me. Like, I really want to do it, you know. And she said, I wouldn't have offered if I didn't want you to come down there. So, yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. We'll go down there sometime in June. Uh, just kind of she'll let me know whenever things are getting, you know, getting good down there. And then um, mid-August, going to go back to Canada, uh, chase, uh, chase black bears again. And um, don't know if I'll top the one from last year, 
but uh, tough to do. yeah, gonna give it give it a shot. Um, it's just cool country. I love ketchup flavored potato chips, and I love Canadians. Their humor is hilarious. It, I, I tell people <laughs> if anytime you want to travel and get out of the lower forty eight and go do a hunt that's affordable and fun, and you're gonna see a lot of action, go chase black bears. I mean, it's it, it's just a cool spot. Um, plus, you get to fish during the day. And you only hunt in the evenings, so fish during the day, get out on the waters, and, and they have some of the best fishing. Then uh, from there, I will drive um, straight from there. I'll go to Montana, uh, 900 tag. Theoretically, I should I put in for it. I should I should get that uh, public land antelope tag archery uh, down around the Biddle Alzada Broadus Powder River area. I leave there and go straight to central Kentucky for velvet whitetails with whitetail heaven outfitters. Um, then from there, I actually will make a pit stop in Iowa, uh, for like three, four days, laundry, refresh the batteries, get reacquainted with the wife and kids. Um, then Idaho elk, uh, with uh, my buddy, Justin at crispy boots and, then come back home, recharge Kansas Whitetail uh, with uh, with Nate and the guys over at Head Hangers, and then settle into Iowa, finish out the year. That's a full year. That that's like a, a fantastic fun that's, year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, it's ambitious. That's for sure. Hopefully, it all keep the wheels on the bus. Got to keep the gram full. Yeah, yeah. I should have no <laughs> problem with content. Yeah, which could be a content every year. So, but. And, you know, and that was the thing. I, I've been wanting to have a, a season like that, you know. And I mean, obviously the more you're out there, the more content you get. And, and I'm not getting any younger, man. I turned 42 in like another week. So um, I, I, I say this a lot. And if it's redundant to anybody listening, I'm sorry. But, um, you know, previous law enforcement career, I don't have a fear of death. I got over that real quick. I have a fear of dying before I get to do everything I want to do. And the clock's ticking. So, Sorry, Gary V, but my life's almost <laughs> over. <laughs> that's the one thing I disagree with Gary on. Dang, that's uh. So okay, well, let me ask you this. So, um, forty-two. Mm-hmm. What would you have done, like, as far as because you haven't been hunting for a super long time, in 20, the grand scheme? Of Twenty-one, things, like, twenty-two years old when I started. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I didn't grow up hunting at all. My dad, I remember my dad. Well, in Central Kentucky, we didn't have whitetails. Um, I mean, I was 14 years old before I heard of a whitetail being in, in our area. And I didn't see my first whitetail until I was 18 years old. Um, and like freaked me out. I saw one like cross the road in front of me and I'm like, I don't know. It was like, a, like a really skinny pony. Like, I don't know what that was. And I'm like, Oh my God, that was a deer. But, um, so my dad, he, he went hunting one day and it was that like, uh, not quite snow but not quite rain. And, um, he sat in the tree underdressed completely as I could even imagine like pre Gore-Tex, like how bad that would have been. But, um, nonetheless, he sat in the tree, froze his ass off the entire time and never saw anything. He's like, he's like, I didn't even see a squirrel, you know? And, um, his buddies, he didn't want to get down. Cause he's like, what if they think I'm a deer? They shoot me, you know? So he sat there until they came to get him. And once they were at the base of his tree, he climbed down. He gave the one guy who invited him his gun that he just bought. He's like, Merry Christmas. You can have all my camo because I'm never doing this ever again. So it was it just wasn't something that he ever pushed off on me um, at all. And when I moved to northern Kentucky, there was a lot of whitetails in northern Kentucky, that Ohio Valley area. And one of the guys I was a cop with, he came up, literally came up to me one day, like mid police shift. And he's like, hey, let's get into deer hunting. I'm like, yeah, I don't really know a whole lot about that. So I went to the public library, and that's how I taught myself how to deer hunt. Is I went and checked out like 15 books and racked up a bunch of late charges. And uh, very first season, shot a couple of does and literally have been hooked ever since. Now I remember the first podcast. Ah. That story just jotted in my memory. Oh, okay. Yep. So, yeah, it's, um, uh, yeah, I ha- you know, a lot of people grew up, you know, they grow up hunting or their parents introduce right. them mm-hmm. to hunting or something. And I didn't have that luxury. I wish I would have, you know, um, it's something I want to do every day. So I could, I'd be even cooler if I got to say I've been doing it for 35 years or 40 years. How long have you been, I guess, in, I guess, quote unquote, in love with like hunting 
big bucks too. And then, so how long did you hunt those in Kentucky? And then how long until you transitioned to Iowa? 2010 is when I got real serious about bow hunting. Mm -hmm. And I think anybody listening, they can probably relate to when they kind of, they, if they made that switch, uh, or when that switch happened, whether it was gun hunting or bow hunting, you do see it a lot more with, I hate to say this, like, I don't want to offend anybody, but you know, you do see it with that bow hunting lifestyle. Right. Um, but it seems like, um, 2010 is kind of when I made that switch where it started to make sense to me where I acknowledged it was okay to not shoot a buck and eat a tag if I had to, and I wanted to chase bigger deer. And then when I met Todd Prignitz, um, and joined up with uh, White Knuckle Productions in 2013 and started technically working for Wicked before I was co-owner, um, that's when it became like, okay, it's four- and five-year-olds only, three-year-olds don't even get a nod. Um, it became where we shed hunt every year, we food plot, we scout, we hang stands in June, July, August, we trim trails, we do whatever we have to do, and that's when it became a 12 month cycle, mm -hmm. you know, completely. And, and, uh, probably got like stupidly obsessed. Like we all are, you know, definitely. Yep. Yes. And then I was, Iowa was always, you know, looked at as the Mecca, you know, that's, that was the place I always wanted to end up, but I never thought I would end up here. Um, when we, when we sold wicked, that's when it became a reality that, uh, they tech during the buyout, they said, Hey, this is the only way we'll do this deal for a period of three years. You have to come work for us, and we want you in Iowa where Wicked was assembled and where we were shipping from, So, um, which is just 20 miles north of where we're at right now. But um, financially, I was able to leave, you know, step away from law enforcement and, and, uh, and make, the, make the move with the family, and I'm like, okay, now's, now's when things are serious. But, you know, and I've said this before too, like before I moved to Iowa – I thought, man, there's a 180 behind every tree. That's what everybody else had always said, right? And then I moved here, and I'm like, wait a second, they're not behind every tree. <laughs> you know, the potential to get big is here because of the differences in uh, not having a rifle season and then having the non-resident restriction. Yep. Those yeah. are the two biggest things. And um, so the potential for big bucks is here and just population. I mean, there's more deer than humans. So that leads to older mature deer. You can only shoot so many, right? Just by law of averages, some mature bucks are going to escape through the cracks, right? Um, so that that was that's the deal. But I've seen some big ones. I've chased some big ones. I've I've targeted a few. Um, played cat and mouse. You know, I've got to come full draw on a couple of 70, 80 class deer, and um, never released an arrow yet. But um, and again, I think that starts to show as you get older into hunting. There was some marginal shots that. I probably would have taken 15 years ago yeah. that I wasn't comfortable taking now. And uh, what is it, the old saying, like, you can't redraw an arrow. You know, once you release it, it's, it's sent, it's gone. So, and you have to live with that decision forever. So I wasn't willing to take that, especially on that caliber class of animal. Um, so not that any animal's worth marginal shooting, but I definitely wasn't going to do it on a buck that I had been chasing, you know, like that. What is your, uh, I guess, home, home state of Iowa? What's your season shaping up like I I mean, how many deer made it through the season? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's the middle of shed season. We just got to walk a farm. Have you walked and picked up any sheds? Yep, yep. Uh, I've um, I've picked up a few sheds this year. All of my target bucks I didn't kill, and I didn't <laughs> hear of them getting killed. We had a really, really hard year this year. Um, super wet fields, standing corn. Mm -hmm. So the rut was happening. It was just happening in the standing corn. And anybody that knows anything about ag fields, there's no trees in standing corn. And some of these fields out here, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of acres, you know, in a in an ag field, a bean field, or a, a corn field. So it was so wet this year. Everybody, uh, a lot of people struggled. It seems like a lot of my buddies that are always big buck killers weren't killing. Guys that had marginal ground that weren't consistently killing, they killed some big ones this year. So um, there's actually there's a, there's a couple of bucks that I one buck I was uh, been chasing for two years, a buck I called Dagger. Um, I saw him a couple of times. This was my number one year for seeing big bucks on the hoof more than 200 yards away from me. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it tops any year ever. Um, <laughs> uh, it was making me sick, but, um, and then there was another buck that, um, uh, I found his match set three and a half miles away 
And I thought, well, I'll probably never see that deer ever on my lease. And lo and behold, he popped up one day at like 350 yards. And like, as soon as I saw, you know, I'm like, dude, it's too short. So there's a couple of, a couple of really good caliber deer. Um, I had a midday exit from the tree, which I should not have, but I did. And walking back into my set, um, I literally walked up, up, walked in, in on him. He was 30 yards away. No. And he turns and looks right at me. He's 65, 70 class deer standing there and trail cameras are taking pictures of him the, the whole entire time. And I'm just like, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. And that's the set I was going to go sit. Punching the stomach right there. Yep. Yep. I should have never, never gotten out. Should have stayed. Right, so it's 2020. Yep. What yep. made you get out? Warm lunch? Had a um, uh, <laughs> it was called a bad experience with a camera guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> got it. Well, hopefully that's all past you then. Yes, yes, very much past. Um, okay, so then go, I guess going into, I guess it's 2020 now, mm -hmm. you're thinking they lived, so it yeah. could be a banner year. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was there was one particular area of my lease that I knew I needed to get a tree stand in. Um, I made one stab at it and immediately aborted mission because I knew it was going to take four or five hours of cutting to get where I needed to get and that was not the time to do it yes in the rut you can get away with a lot of crazy stuff but man that's four or five hours yeah. of Iowa daylight that I could have been hunting in some other you know good spots they just weren't great but um so this summer that that's like the number one goal of the year is this summer I don't care if it takes me a week I'm getting a set and I'm getting some shooting lanes trimmed into this particular cedar thicket that I just it's the spot Mm -hmm. It's my third year of hunting this property. You only have to watch them come out of the tree line three years in a row before you finally make a decision to go <laughs> there, right? Yeah, yep. Uh, uh, we've all been there. You know, you see something happen, and you're like, man, I I should probably go there. Well, no, no, maybe that's a freak, in, you know, freak, freak scenario. And then the third season in a row, you're like, huh, man, those deer really like to come out of that spot right there. Maybe I should have a set there. Is it just a thick bedding area that they're coming out of? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, they're they're following the does up out of that bedding area. The bucks are never there except for like one week a year. It's the only time I've ever seen ever seen a buck come out of there is from November eighth through November fourteenth. Period. Just you in know, like cedar cedar thicket bedding area adjacent to food. Yep, I and the does don't even seems like they don't even use it that much until that time of year. Oh, really? Yeah. Just from going in there from being harassed and pushed around yep or whatever. yep i think and i really think it's a it's almost like they're pushing them into an area that's what it it's what it seems like to me you've got you got food on the south food on the north and then um no exit to the to the east it just or well there is exit but it's the rough way to go you know what i mean it's not anything anybody a human or a deer would want to travel um, and then I can get to the west of them, the open field, and it's just they come up out of there and they just fan out, you know. But if I get close enough, even the biggest, you know, hook or slice that they take out of that out of that bedding area, I can still give myself a, probably a fifty yard shot, and I'll take that all day. What so that's, that's, go ahead. I was just gonna just recap. That's the spot that uh, you and I had some discussions on mm -hmm. like you had talked about you know yep. documenting some stuff and the process that yep yep that's the spot i want to go into and and really dissect i think that's the spot on that farm that i'm i'm overlooking something and it's almost like and i've looked at it so much to where i'm like i need a fresh set of eyes somebody who has no background to this property because somebody's going to walk in there and go this is where you need to be you know yeah. I, I and i know it's so obvious i've just overthought it so many times um, but yeah, I mean, I've got three years of video footage of watching bucks pour out of that spot, dog and does around there chasing stuff around. It's just a cool little inside corner, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, how, yeah. bi how big is this lease? Cause I'm sure some people are 100, 120 acres. That's okay. all I can afford. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 120 acres. Um, it's really, really tough, um, to pick up a lease. I'm not native to Iowa and, um, Iowa Iowa natives don't really like non <laughs> Iowa natives. So I'm not from here. didn't grow up here. I mean, granted I pay taxes and my kids go to school here. One daughter graduated from school here. Um, but, um, 
it's, you know, a lot of private ground. Nobody wants to give it up. They're letting their grandkids hunt it or, you know, their nephews hunt it and stuff like that. So I pay for a lease that the landowner actually still lets other people hunt it for free. There's nothing I can do about it. It's a crappy he lease. He charges me, <laughs> but doesn't charge them. There. Yeah. Who made that deal? That's yeah. A- well, <laughs> that's the other thing. So a lot of times I've found that they don't, they won't write or sign leases. Uh, you know, it's just, what are you trying to do? Like snake my ground out from underneath me? Is this some kind of buyout that I'm just not reading the fine print? I'm like, no, there's three lines. It just says I'm the only one that can exclusively hunt here. Nope, won't sign it. But I'll take your money and I'll say that it's okay for you to sign it <laughs> or to hunt it. So, um, yeah, that's that's the best I've got. I'm I, I'm actively seeking, trying to find some more ground to hunt. It's um, it's just it's man, it's really tough. So I keep going back to the public, you know, and and I'll and I'll hunt some public stuff and try to keep a little pressure off the lease. But yeah, I, I mean, you know, and, and it's funny, especially now, uh, it seems like there's a huge private versus public debate, and that's why one of my logos even says "public lands, private lands." I literally do not care. If there's a big buck on there and I've got access to him, as long as it's not a high fence, I'll I'll chase him. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm the same. I think yeah. everyone's on the same boat, but for some yeah. reason, everyone has their agendas. Well, and it, you know, and then I hate the whole. Well, I killed a my 120 on public was harder to kill than your 180 on private. What? How? Tell me. Like I don't. Because my my le- private lease gets way more pressure than my public land. Well, I think it's one of way those, more. I think it's one of those things where you know so many people have c- came up watching different TV shows or mm-hmm. whatever, and you have the hunting personalities or celebrities or whatever you want to sure. call them on these big managed pieces. And yeah. I think like yeah. you know in my back in my mind, I would love to have something like that, right, but right, it's just not right. it's not realistic for yeah uh, even most people in the in, in the industry uh, and a lot of us. Yeah, you know, yeah. A lot of our, a lot of our circle and uh, fellow industry folks are hunting mm-hmm. pieces a lot like the general public. Like, there's no difference from right. what I'm doing, you're doing, Jake's doing, Cameron, yeah, versus anyone listening to this podcast. Right, right. I mean, we're all in similar boats, hunting similar pieces, similar pressure, similar deer. Yeah, exactly. Well, and you know, like uh, back in Kentucky, um, you know, I was killing pretty good deer back home. And some of the, my fellow cops that I worked with, they when I, when they knew that I was filming hunts, you know, I was I was shooting some deer that were you know a little bit bigger than what they had been shooting and stuff, and and they used to tease me. They're like, "You're tranquilizing those deer." And then you're waking <laughs> them up, and you've got a pen. You're releasing them, you know, and right before you shoot them, I'm like, "What?" But um, imagine it, having a deer farm in your backyard as a kid growing up and killing nice deer. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Every time I kill a good deer, like on school, like during, like, oh, you killed on your backyard. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, no, it's like, did yeah. you shoot your cow, Mrs. Whatever? <laughs> hey, I tell you what, I would like to have is I would like to have a lease that butted up to a deer farm. Uh, I would And too, I would yeah. be hanging real close to that fence, yeah. you know, and on my side, you know, because you know those does in the pen, you got a concentration of like 60, 70 does that just went in estrus. Every buck in the area is coming there to check that out, you know? Yeah. Yeah, didn't, you had some yeah, stories yeah, about like scrapes popping up in the yeah, backyard. And we, like, uh, the house is completely surrounded by cornfields, and then there'd be like <laughs> some like ha- hackleberry tree or something like that, uh-huh. and it's just you know like it's yeah. is there and it's gone, and it hasn't been there last year or so because I was gonna put a camera over it because uh-huh. it was, would be funny because it's like giant cornfield. <laughs> oh yeah, but yeah. yeah, it's uh, well, and I will say like um, good being good friends with Sam Calora. Um, you know, he's just, he's 20, 20 miles north of where we're sitting right now. And there, there will be days he'll call me and he'll say, Hey, I just looked out to the pen of my deer and all of my bucks are on their feet and they are all running fence lines. Pacing the edge. Yeah. Yep. And I'm like, okay, bye. And literally I'm grabbing my bow and my pack and I'm, I'm heading somewhere. Um, so, you know, pit, yeah, they're pinned deer. I get it. But when they're all doing that. I've seen a lot of consistencies, uh, and then this past year on Facebook, he started posting. He would do his 3 p.m. update, and he would post 25% of uh, bucks are laying down, 75% are up, or all my bucks are up. Or, mm-hmm. And it was neat to be in the field and read that and then see what kind, you know, see if I could get it to match up. And, you know, 70% of the time it did match up with what I was seeing too. Yeah, what I, what I found most with having in the backyard too is the bucks are pretty aggressive 
mm-hmm. regardless during that time frame and you yeah. know are doing a lot of that pacing but it's when those does start acting really weird and that's when you know that they're about to hit you know be an estrus oh yeah yeah you know, that usually matches up with like a lockdown phase yep, um, yep. so that's always interesting uh-huh 100 percent didn't mean to derail the conversation <laughs> not at all no no um <laughs> what are you guys thinking <laughs> Well, here's here's a question I have for you. So, John, I've known you for a little bit now, mm-hmm. and you uh, super personal person. Mm-hmm. Um, how with with the as you mentioned, private versus public. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether we like it or not, there's various kind of quote unquote clicks yeah. throughout the industry. But one person <laughs> that has a spider web weave through everything is is you. You're <laughs> one of them. How how do you do that? Or is that from law enforcement? Have you always been like that? It, w- what is that like? No, I think it, it definitely is. I mean. Um, you know, we've all had that friend where you're like, man, you're playing both sides of the fence. And I don't do that. Um, I am opinionated. You guys have heard my opinions from time to time on stuff. I don't usually hold it back, but my, I just work on my delivery. Um, you know, I still look at everything that we're all hunters. We're all doing the same thing. We're all trying to do the same thing. Um, but through that manufacturing side and the different companies, you know, hey, I, the, the biggest thing that I pitch to companies that I work with is how my ability to enter network and code network with different brands. And it, it's a juggling act. And so you have to kind of be that person. And I'm not being a chameleon. I'm not being anybody different than I am. I just, I look at hunting as hunting and the industry as the industry, you know. And I try not to let those two things bleed into each other to where it still stays fun to me. Um, but for a lot of years, man, I was a private person and I didn't have a whole lot of friends other than just the cops I worked with. Um, I couldn't have a whole lot of friends. So even if I wanted to go blow off steam and have a beer, I'd go to like a neighboring city or state because <laughs> I I, people couldn't know me, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. So when I got out of law enforcement, I kind of told myself, I said, you know, I, I want to be a lot more personal and I want to get to know a lot more people and, and that kind of stuff. But You know, it's easy to get caught up in this whole industry, and I wake up every day, and I tell myself, you're going to kick ass, you're going to bust at, you're going to do harder than you did yesterday, but you're nobody important. And I think some people, unfortunately, they can get into this thing, and they get a different perception of themselves or maybe who they need to be or who, what people want them to be. Um, And I'm like, man, I've literally been the same cat my entire life you know what I mean Mm -hmm. and um, just try to be as authentic as I can you know I don't believe in recreations on video I just I tell it like it is and I think fortunately people respect me for it you know we had a similar conversation with Aaron uh, Warbritton this morning um, from the hunting public where you know those guys are finding all kinds of crazy success and um, you know some of the guys on that on the THP team I guess Mm -hmm. Aaron's telling them like listen don't believe, don't get caught up in all the hype and who, who people think we are and read yeah. the headlines. Just stay focused on the work that got us here and just keep doing what we do and mm-hmm. be yourself. You know, and it's funny because, like, this was this was a big growth year for me at ATA. Um, granted, we're not supposed to go there and sign contracts and network and that kind of stuff, you know, on the media side of things. But it was a big growth for, for me this year. And uh, this year, kind of like an exit interview and – when you get a little bit of feedback or like a restaurant says, Hey, leave us a comment. What'd you like? I left every interview. Okay. Why are we doing this? What is it that I'm doing? I want to hear the good and the bad. And they said, man, because of your, the way you network with people, mm-hmm. you know, like you haven't ruffled any feathers and you're our guy that can put Sitka camo on a diamondback cover. You're the guy that can, bring a Exodus trail camera, um, on a grizzly photo shoot or whatever it may be. So, you know, and, and every marketing director said, literally the only thing we can tell you is keep doing exactly what you're doing because you haven't wavered. Now it's a longer process doing it the way that I've tried to do it. Um, there's no quick fix. There's no bot likes. There's no bot followers. There's no faking what I'm doing or faking the brands or, I, I actually try my damnedest to never name drop ever. I try really try to never do that. Um, so everybody just says, Hey, keep doing what you're doing. And I think, um, it's kind of like building a house. 
you can build a foundation in like two days and then start going four stories high and the first storm it's done topples over but if you spend time on the foundation mm-hmm. build it the right way build it organically um it pays off you know then you can build as high as you want well it's certainly not by uh lack of effort i, I know that that's something that uh you and i always kind of joke about is like all right it's it's <laughs> tuesday june 8th like who's gonna who's who's still working and it's yep. twelve thirty in the morning uh-huh. you know what i mean yeah 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 and and even like with the gym stuff uh one of my buddies he said man he's like He's like, are you posting those pictures of being at the gym at like 11 or 12 o'clock at night just because you want to seem like you're a badass? I'm like, no, I'm trying to show people that there's only so many hours in the day and you can fit it all in. You know, it's lazy people will never get ahead. Mm-hmm. And one of my favorite phrases is um, a person will never be hungry. That's always been fed. And I've never been fed. So I will always be hungry. <laughs> always. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was never, I mean, you know, I grew up very fortunate um, as far as my parents' lifestyle. They'd go to Bahamas and leave me behind. <laughs> my parents had a ton of money, you know what I mean? But I never got shit. Right. Um, when I was driving dirt late model race cars, the reason why I'm not still driving dirt late model race cars is I ran out of money. But everybody saw my dad's name on the side of the truck, which I or side of the race car. I put his name on there just because I love my dad and, you know, try to give him a little bit of business. But everybody assumed that I was sponsored by my dad's company. So nobody ever sponsored my car. Nobody ever gave me a dime. You know what I mean? <laughs> it worked and against you. Yeah. Yeah, it did. It totally worked against me. So, yeah, my old man never gave me shit, man. But And I'm thankful for it because he taught me a, a strong work ethic. Um you know, like I did that short film, Work More Hours, several years ago. And um, that's probably my motto. That's That'll be my lifetime motto. Just literally work more hours. You know, not to steal Cameron Haynes, but the nobody cares, work harder. I love that one, too. You know, I don't even know the guy, but I like that phrase because it's true. Nobody gives a shit. You know, just work your ass off. Yep. You know, and yeah. oh, man, I'm depressed. Life sucks. And then change it. Like. I won't even give myself 30 seconds to say that comment because that's 30 seconds. I could have been changing something to make it better. That's it. You know, <laughs> just work, work, you know, there's, there's a really, lot of, there's uh, no tricks or anything to it. No, it's there really isn't. Just yeah. do the work for a long time. We constantly <laughs> talk about that. And I feel, I think sometimes people are like, they think that we just say that. To, Forget those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Just to say it, just to say it. But like, <laughs> freaking truth uh-huh. you know? it, it is 100 percent, 100 percent. well you know and um one of my buddies was like man he's like um you know you really buy into the the gary v philosophy and i was like who's gary v he's like gary vanderchuk i said hmm is he chase like is he a western hunter <laughs> i had no idea who it was <laughs> i had never heard of gary v until like three months ago really I swear had no clue who he was. Um, and then I started listening to the guy, and I'm like, yeah, that's exactly, yeah. Like, like, you know what I mean? Like, I've been saying this shit for years, you know what I mean? So, um, it, it's so it's so true. Like, and if somebody needs a little motivational kick in the butt, man, listen to that guy, you know? Take it from somebody else if you don't want to take it from somebody from the hunting industry. But what's unique is he's applying that to his world, whether it be his um, – in sports marketing or Super Bowl commercials or whatever. But the common theme is the same, whether it be in construction or the hunting industry or photography or trail camera manufacturing. I mean, it's all the same. That's why guys like Marcus Limonis has that show, The Profit. He can go and invest in any company he wants. He doesn't know shit about the companies. It doesn't matter. You implement the process. It's all the same. Yep. It doesn't change. You know, and everybody thinks that, they got to spend 20 years trying to reinvent the wheel. Okay. I'm 19.9 years or yeah, 19.9 years ahead of the game, you know, because I didn't waste all that time thinking about it. Just do it. Don't be a squirrel. Just make a decision and do something. <laughs> if it's the wrong thing, then you can change it. You know what That's I mean? That's just it. Yep. Quicker pivots. Yep. And then the ability to like reinvent, I mean, going into white knuckle productions and then leaving that and starting Arrow Wild TV, then getting into photography and short films and um, then kind of branching into that product lifestyle and then understanding why it was working was because of the marketing ideas behind that product lifestyle. Then once you 
can kind of continue to capitalize on that, I mean, I'm not changing. I'm just evolving. And being able to do that, look, five years ago, I was still buying heroin for a living, you know, and then now. As an undercover police <laughs> officer. As an undercover police officer. <laughs> but Yeah. Uh, <laughs> some funny YouTube some people comments think you're right there. Right. He's an ex-drug addict. <laughs> yeah. You're like, man, this guy, jeez, I tell you what. But, you know, I, I love that question when people say, where do you see yourself in five years? I'm like, that is so like 1980. You know what I mean? Like. I couldn't even imagine thinking, and I think about it now, I'm like, man, five years ago, I was in Kentucky, I was wearing a police uniform, you know, literally had no idea what I was going to do next. I thought I'd just ride out my days and, you know, be a cop for 27 years or, you know, whatever. And, um, you know, now I'm four years into Iowa and my full career, you know, income job is surrounded by, you know, photography and marketing. That's it, you know, in this industry. So that's talking about a 180, you know what I mean? Well, I, if, if you don't like to look into the future, let's say, or set those five-year goals, mm -hmm. um, how, I need those personally. Uh -huh. uh, whether they're cheesy or not, maybe it's, I'm a little more structured. But uh -huh. um, how do you, I guess, keep vision – as you're going through those with so many different ventures yep. or is this every day adding coals to the fire and seeing yeah. which one catches the most yeah. flame? Yeah. 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 I mean, for, uh, you know, yeah, every day, every day it's, um, it's constantly, um, it's, it's, it's looking at what the trends are and what is going on. If there's a way that I can change Johnny Utah or I can change Errol wild to stay current or stay ahead of it, then so be it. As soon as I deem something as a loser, it, to me, it's not quitting. It's I won because I acknowledged, I saw, I cut it off, stop wasted time, and then put focus into something else. Some people say, man, I had this business idea and I gave up on, man, I just gave up on myself. I feel like a loser. No. If you decided to pull the plug and take your focus and put it someplace else effectively, then you actually won. You know, you didn't lose. So a lot of my stuff is, like I said, going to those trade shows and and try to identify things before they're going to happen or as they're going to happen, stay current, um, and then keep it evolving. I mean, I think in five years from now, I'll probably have four or five other companies that I'll, I'll own and maybe one that I don't, or two that I have now, I won't have then. Johnny Utah Holdings LLC. <laughs> <laughs> A prestige worldwide. Wide, wide. Worldwide, wide, wide. You get that reference, Chad? <laughs> yeah, I got okay. that. That's one of the few movie, <laughs> movies I've seen in the last 20 years. Yeah. I'm not a big movie person, but I have seen that one. I'm glad. That's a, that's a great. <laughs> yeah. It's a great. Um, okay. We're rolling in on about an hour. Okay. Um, there's a lot of different things that we could always talk about, and we might just have to revisit them on another day. But as, we ha as we're sitting here now, mm -hmm. anything coming to mind right now? No, you want, nothing. You want a cool cop story? Always want a cool cop. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thought about this one the other day. So we talk about stupid criminals. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, there's some really dumb criminals out there. So when I was undercover, um, anybody who has the informant, you're lead on the case. So you're the one that writes the ops plan and that kind of stuff. Well, when another agent has a target house they're going to hit, then it's all the whole team comes back together. Because a lot of times it's little solo missions, two, three guys here, two, three guys here. But when it comes time to hit a house, then everybody's, you know, thigh rig, raid vest, everybody hooks up, and you go in 14, 10 to 14 man teams. And um, so I show up at the meeting. What's my assignment? You're on perimeter. Because I don't know anything about this dope house they've been working. So the safest place is not put me on an entry guy, <laughs> just put me on the outside of the building and catch runners that are going to bail out of the windows. So dark, dark area, not well lit street light stuff, you know, and I'm just kind of camped out underneath this, uh, this big oak tree. And, um, I've got, you know, like I got a thigh rig vest, tactical BDUs, and I've got my little short AR. I'm mounted up like this and I'm just kind of leaned up in the shadows and I'm just waiting. I'm looking at windows, looking at windows. And I see this guy like kind of be bopping down the sidewalk. And this guy looks over at me and he's like, Psst. I kind of glance over at him and I'm thinking he'll keep walking. And he goes, Psst. Hey dude, I kind of glance over and I go, what? He's like, man, I got that fire dog. You want to get that? I got some melt. I got that melt on me, you know? So he's talking about, he's got a bunch of crack on him. 
<laughs> and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me right now. <laughs> And I look over, and I'm thinking, man, I'm waiting for the flashbang. I'm waiting for him to hit this house, you know. And I'm looking and looking, and finally I glance over, and I went, yeah, yeah, bring it on over here. Dude comes walking up, and he's, like, looking left and right. He's like, man, there's a ton of cops. Man, this area is hot as shit right now. <laughs> and he pulls it out and puts it in my hand. And I just go ahead and drop, you know, I've got it on a, on a sling. I just drop my AR, and I grab my uh, my zip ties and just shackle him up behind his back, and I go, sit down. And I sit him down on the ground. I go, don't move. About the time I turn back to the house, they hit the door, flashbang, they go in. Nobody comes out. Nobody bailed out of a window. We get our guy, and then they come out, and they're like, oh, do we have a runner? I'm like, no, this guy just tried to sell me crack right here. <laughs> like, And I'm wearing, like, narc vest. You know what I mean? Like, uh -huh. police narc uh, right on my, uh, on my jacket. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me, you know? <laughs> Like, literally tries to sell dope to the guy in, you know, a narcotics guy. Like, right uh, on scene. That's some and, he acknowledged, right there. Yeah, and he acknowledged that there was, he's like, man, there's cops <laughs> everywhere around here tonight. We got to do this quick. And he wasn't your guy, though. No, like, no, yeah, literally. It was random. like a twofer, you know what I mean? So, that was, a, that was a pretty good one. But there was, like, there was stupid stuff like that happening all the time. Do you that, miss law enforcement days at all? I do. Um, I miss I miss that brotherhood. Um, it's, a, you know, it's a different brotherhood, you know, like, you know, I've got real close friends like you guys and stuff like that. Um, but man, I had a, I had a team of guys that it's, it's different when like when somebody's got a gun and they're protecting you. Yeah. Um, that's a little bit different scenario, but, uh, I miss that brotherhood. I, I miss the training. Um, I was very fortunate at the department I was with, uh, if you could articulate any training whatsoever that you needed it, they'd send you there. Um, and when I first started, I'm like, oh, this training sucks. And then as you get older, I'm like, man, this is cool. Like they sent me to digital forensic photography. That's where I learned all my basic settings and photography stuff, you know, it was on the computer, you know, on the police time, but, um, tactical shooting range days. I mean, who doesn't like going and shooting guns, you know? So that stuff was fun. Um, the paperwork and the politics I could have done without that. I don't miss any of that at all, but, um, the, yeah, the actual on-the-job stuff, that was that was pretty cool. It was definitely pretty structured, too, um, which is kind of unlike me. I was going to say, yeah, because given your lifestyle and photo like photography line of work, I feel like it's a very creative mind, yeah. no rules. Well, and I think that was the struggle that I had with the politics and the paperwork is creatively, I'm like, this is dumb. This doesn't make sense. There's a whole lot better way. I looked at – even even in the, like – public sector like it should have been private like i wanted to i wanted our police department to run like a company mm -hmm. right and i'm like we need to fire him because like he's not producing but he's still making the same as this guy um and this is a waste of money like these are things that we need to be doing differently again i i, I think everything should be looked at like a business no different if you got a basketball player that's not performing like everything should be almost performance based you know, even if it's a cop job or a teacher or whatever, you know, if a teacher's got students that are learning and they're scoring high on tests and they're going and getting, you know, full academic rides, she needs to get paid more than the, the teacher that has nobody getting academic rides, you know. So I just think it should everything should be kind of based on performance like that. You know, the people who hustle hard and, and earn are the people that should be, you know, rewarded. No argument there. Yeah. Right on. <laughs> Nail on yep. the head. Yeah. Um, I mean, anything else? We actually are going to be shooting your Whitetail Cribs episode tomorrow morning. Yeah, which, that's cool. Uh, pretty excited about. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I mean, I don't know. Well, I had the taxidermist add about 18 inches to every buck uh, <laughs> as soon as I found out you guys were coming. Um, wait, they, the camera does add 7 inches? Because I know it adds like 10 pounds like to a body. So, is it 7 inches on horns? I'm trying to think of... Cameron got that wide angle. <laughs> yeah, there, there it is. Go. I'm trying to think what well, it typically looks like you've seen the deer in person versus when you go back and watch the Whitetail Cribs episode. It's weird. Like, I've been pretty much in person on 90% of them probably, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I can't say that I've really went back and watched them that close to to tell a diff to see a difference. I think it's pretty true to to what it is. Yeah. I'm trying to think the ones that I were at. It's all about the angles. Watched. 
Yeah. But I'm just saying I don't think we're like doing a job to be deceivious though. Oh no. no, no that's right, what I'm no, saying. No. Like they're it's not like Cameron's like way underneath <laughs> like that's funny. trick photography. Yeah. Um no I've I've got some 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 stuff that'll be ground level and some that will go up on the balcony and new bear. Kind of look down at stuff. Yeah, yeah. New, giant new new bear, bear, new giant deer. Bear. And it's funny because, uh, I mean, he felt big at the Deer Classic in that room. And then you put oh, an eight-foot sure. ceiling over top of him. He's literally like eight inches from touching the ceiling. Wow. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. What's so the wife say about that? She's pissed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she uh, she told me last night, she goes, this has become a house of death. <laughs> like, no. No. House like, of memories. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I was like, you're looking at it all wrong. And then of course my sons are like, what if, like, what if we have some pet cemetery stuff happen and all these things come back to life? I'm like, grab a bow, <laughs> we'll shoot them again. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, so I'm I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to you, uh, you guys. And um, again, you know, for a lot of years I was a very private person. Like, not a lot of people have been inside my home, so um, it's kind of neat. Like, it, you know, and and some of these deer um, have never seen the light of day because again. You know, Sean Mullins wasn't showing off any dead, you know, <laughs> any bow hunts. Oh, yeah. I didn't think of that. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff that has that's never been seen. So, um, so we can neat. go ahead and say exclusive, not never seen before. Yeah. Yeah. Some of these have Always. never been never been seen before. Uh, you got to be careful. We don't want, like, DNR going, what? You know, <laughs> uh, but, no, it'll be it'll be neat. It'll be neat for you guys to, yeah, to see that. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to tell some stories about some of these hunts and stuff, how they, how they came together. And most of them were with an element of luck <laughs> don't oh, <laughs> to, some, <laughs> to some degree but yeah awesome well we will link to um as many ventures that we can because there is a cap <laughs> on yeah. the characters yeah uh but we'll link to um all the things that you have going on and i'll let you verbally kind of say if someone wants to find you or have yeah. any questions about photography which i know you have a class coming up yeah yeah i do uh definitely um want to plug that uh i'm doing a it's majority photo there will be a little bit of film um, education included into it, but it's, it's going to be heavy, heavy set on photography. Um, I'm doing a class in Southeast Iowa, and then I'm also teaching one in Northern Kentucky back-to-back -back days. They're one day classes. It's 250 bucks a person, or if you have a buddy, uh, two buddies can go for $400 and, um, lunch will be catered. Everybody's going to go home with a, with a cool t-shirt, um, uh, for the event. And uh, it'll be a lot of fun. It'll be a big Q and A, a lot of product photography, um, a lot of shutter stuff like sporting events and dance recitals. You know, even if somebody doesn't have to be a hunter, somebody just wants to learn how to take better family photos to capture memories of their kids growing up. Um, that's something I did not do. My wife and I were horrible about that when our kids were little. And um, so, anyways, that's uh, that's going to be the idea of the class. Um, so I hope that uh, we fill it. Uh, I'm going to do about 25 spots per class. So would love to, would love to fill the room. Very cool. Yeah. I'll save you some time on YouTube. Oh uh, my God. And that's going through thing. and trying to learn it all on your own. Yeah. I mean, I'll do like four shots of five hour energy and tell people to have two or three ink pens and a pad of paper. Cause I'm going to talk fast and I'm going to cover <laughs> a lot of stuff. Um, but I mean, it, I can't even begin to imagine how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours I have on YouTube teaching this crap myself. And I'm going to, I'm going to get somebody pretty damn good in eight hours. So anybody wants to get a crash course on photography, um, different settings and styles. And then there's going to be a big Q and a session at the end, like how to network and how to introduce yourself and how to get into the industry and maybe possibly get paid. You know, you're the guy for it. So yeah. awesome. Well, thank you very much, John. And we'll call it a wrap and check out his whitetail cribs episode, uh, whatever Wednesday goes live. Sweet. Awesome.